Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight for, um, as Mark said, it's our uh, first online conservation lecture series, Stories from the Field. Um, and as this is our first online session, please bear with us through any hiccups in this process. Um, tonight, I am going to talk to you about um, what is our newest flagship conservation project at Bristol Zoological Society. And that is focused on the Western lowland gorillas of Equatorial Guinea. And I just wanna make a note um, at the beginning here, as some of you might have uh, small children with you, that there are some unpleasant images of animals in the wildlife trade in this presentation. Um, and that can be upsetting to, to people, um, but unfortunately it's an important part of the story that we're gonna tell tonight. Um, so just as a bit of a warning that there are some images in there, it's not throughout the whole talk, um, but it is an in a few places, so just that you're aware. So before we get started, um, I just want to tell you a little bit about me. So as Mark said, I'm the head of the Field Conservation and Science Department at the Bristol Zoological Society. And that means that I have the amazing job of overseeing our global conservation programs. So um, these are our uh, conservation pro projects that are all around the world and I'm going to talk about them in a bit more detail in a minute and also our higher education provision so not many people know but actually we run uh, six degree programs with four different higher education institutions here at Bristol Zoo Gardens and these are joint degrees and many of the students are actually taught on site at Bristol Zoo in our campus there in my background is actually in primatology, which is one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about the project I'm going to talk to you about tonight. So I started my career uh, many years ago <laughs> studying white-faced capuchin monkeys in Costa Rica, which I'm sure many of you have seen uh, before in the movies or on television. There's a little picture of one there. And then later I moved to Africa to start to study Sanjay Mangabe monkeys, which I'm sure far fewer people have heard of. Um, they are a uh, an endangered monkey found only in one small area of, of southern Tanzania. And more recently, I've been working very closely with the IUCN Species Survival Commission Primate Specialist Group um, on things that are more to do with applied conservation and currently leading on a conservation action plan for all of the mangabe, drill, and mandrel species across Central and East Africa. So those are just some of the, the things that I've been involved in with primates over the years. And the most recent one, as I said, is obviously our flagship project on the Western lowland gorilla that I'm gonna to talk to you about tonight. So at Bristol Zoo, we are driven or guided by a conservation master plan. So this is a plan that outlines our global conservation work and it guides us in how we will undertake that work and how we will set our priorities. And it also lays out are three strands of conservation. So much like a, a lot of traditional zoos, we breed threatened species through our conservation breeding programs. But we also have this very active field conservation and research department, which is directed and run by our conservation scientists in-house. So rather than acting as a donor for external projects, which is the more typical zoo model, we actually have staff on site and in the field running our own projects. And finally, we're very active in behavior change and advocacy. So working to promote pro-conservation behavior among our visitors and the wider public. So for example, our current behavior change campaign is focused on supporting sustainable palm oil. So the production and the use of certified sustainable palm oil. And if that's something that you have an interest in, I would encourage you to check out the Bristol Zoo website to find out more about that campaign. So as I said, we have quite an active global conservation program. And if we look specifically at that, we work in 10 countries on 14 projects that are focused on 18 target species. And the majority of those projects are focused in Africa or here in the United Kingdom on our native species. And it's one of these African projects that I'm gonna be talking about here tonight. And that's the project focused in Equatorial Guinea. Now, not many people have probably know that much about Equatorial Guinea. It's not a country that's typically in the news. It is a very small country in Central Africa and it's made up of an island portion. So a larger island of Bioko and a smaller island of Anabon. 
And the capital city of Malabo is actually on that, that island of Bioko. And then a mainland section that's called Rio Muni, and it's sandwiched between Cameroon and Gabon. The population is only around 1.3 million people. And throughout most of it, these are people living at relatively low densities. So you have quite high population density in the cities, of which there's a major city on Bioko and another major city on, um, in Rio Muni. But for the most part throughout the rest of the country, it's pretty low population density. You can also see here from this image of our study site that it can be quite mountainous. And the region in which we work is, is very, very mountainous. Equatorial Guinea is quite important for conservation and for biodiversity. It's part of um, what is known as a biodiversity hotspot. So the Ghanaian forests of West Africa biodiversity hotspot that you can see highlighted here. And these forests, along with the forests of the Congo Basin, harbor over 20% of all known species of plants and animals on the planet. So in terms of protection and wildlife conservation, this is a really, really key area where we need to be focusing our attention. And among these forests, across the Ghanaian forests of, uh, and also the Congo Basin, those in, in Equatorial Guinea really stand out. They have some of the most pristine forests in Africa. In fact, much of the country remains forested, over 60%. And in a lot of areas, there's very little human activity compared to other Central and West African countries, at least until very, very recently. And you can see some images here from a National Geographic photo shoot that happened several years ago, just showing the continuous widespread forest cover within the country, which is really, really amazing. And on the island of Bioko, one of the endemic species that you actually might have seen if you saw last night or this weekend's BBC uh, primates documentary. These are the Bioko subspecies of drill. So the mainland has incredible biodiversity. Bioko has incredible, the island of Bioko has incredible biodiversity as well, but we find it continuing into the mainland and in particular large mammals like you see here. So you can see quite a healthy population of forest elephant. This is a different species to the more well-known savanna elephant that we're all much, probably much, much more familiar with. Quite a few leopards, good population, uh, mandrills, which we see quite a lot in our field site, central chimpanzees, and of course, among these also the gorillas that we're gonna talk more about in a moment. So gorillas have often been referred to as gentle giants, you know, especially in relation to um, some of the reputation given to say their cousins, the chimpanzees, who have often been portrayed as maybe more active and more aggressive. But gorillas are often portrayed as being quite gentle, quite, um, quite calm, quite quiet. Um, and in fact, a lot of that has to do with their diet being vegetarians. There are actually four different subspecies of gorilla, two species and four subspecies. The Eastern species, uh, Gorilla Berengii, is most well known for the mountain gorillas that I'm sure many of you are familiar with from the Virunga volcanoes, made famous by Diane Fossey and Gorillas in the Mist. And then their lesser known cousin, the Eastern Lowland Gorilla or Grower's Gorilla, that comes from the lowland rainforests of the Democratic Republic of Congo. The Western species, is also divided into two subspecies. So the Cross River Gorilla, which comes from this very small region on the border between Nigeria and Cameroon. And there's only about 300 animals of, of that subspecies left. So really, really critical situation for them. And the Western Lowland Gorilla, which we're gonna talk about here. All of these subspecies are considered critically endangered on the IUCN Red List. So this means they are at very high risk of extinction in the very near future without significant conservation interventions. So things are, are pretty critical for these, for these different subspecies of gorilla. Before we start to talk about our project specifically, I think it's important to help everybody understand a little bit about gorillas in general. So I'm gonna talk through a little bit about their social behavior and reproduction and why all of that stuff matters for conservation. So gorillas live in social groups, usually one adult male, I'm sure everybody knows, called the silverback, and somewhere in the neighborhood of two to six adult females, and then their young offspring. 
So these are going to be offspring that are still kind of dependent on mum, uh, whether that's nursing or still needing her for protection, etc. Occasionally, an adult male may tolerate a second adult male in the group but they often have some kind of prior relationship if that's the case. So maybe they're related, or it could be a son of that male who's, who's still just a blackback, not yet sexually mature. Both males and females will leave the group in which they're born at sexual maturity to find a new group in which to mate. So this means that the strongest bonds within the group are gonna be between adult males and adult females. And this is important because it's different from some other species of primates. So in chimpanzees, for example, males will stay in the group in which they're born their whole lives. And we have male relatives living in groups together and those male relatives form very strong bonds. In Japanese macaques, which some of you might be familiar with if you've seen the pictures of the very fuzzy monkeys sitting in the hot springs in Japan, they are female bonded. So females stay in the group in which they're born their whole lives and they form very strong bonds with their female kin. We don't see this in gorillas. Females in gorillas tend not to be quite so, that social with each other and don't have the strongest bonds in the group. We also see that there are quite large differences between males and females in what we refer to as sexual dimorphism. Males can sometimes be twice the size of females in adulthood. And as I said before, they're mostly vegetarian. So they're eating herbs and leaves and grasses, but also some insects. If we look at their reproduction and what we call life history, so characteristics of their lives as they grow, we can see that females tend to have their first baby around nine years of age. And they will nurse that infant sometimes upwards of four and a half, five years. And sometimes they wait between four and six years before they will even have another baby. And that's because it can take a long time to learn how to be a gorilla. So we just have to look at this image of this little baby gorilla looking up at its mum. It's going to be doing that all the time. It's watching what mum's eating. It's watching who mum is socializing with. It's watching who mum stays away from. So all of the things that they need to do to learn how to be a gorilla, they're learning from mum. And that can take a long time. In captivity, we know that gorillas can live upwards of 50 years. It's going to be less in the wild, but they still live a considerable period of time. So why does this matter for conservation? Why does it matter what their social behavior is or their reproductive, uh, re reproductive history is? Well, it tells us they have this long period of juvenile dependency. They're dependent on mum for a long time. They have a long time before they reach sexual maturity. So a long time before they ever have a first baby of their own and quite a long time between births. And this tells us that it will take a long time for that population to grow and that the loss of any one individual can have quite a big impact on the health of that population. And when we're facing conservation threats like hunting, like disease outbreaks, um, like habitat loss, all of these things that can affect the survival of individuals, the fact that it can take a very long time for populations to grow is really, really important for us to consider. And it re-emphasizes the importance of trying to protect these animals in the first place. Now, something that um, is probably more poignant now in, in what we're all going through in this, in this epidemic, pandemic, um, is the fact that gorillas are very susceptible to infectious disease. So it's something that's very concerning for those of us that are working with gorillas and something that's very concerning obviously to everybody right now in the world is this, the outbreak of infectious disease. And in primates, it's exacerbated by increasing human activity. So the more we have logging roads that are opening up areas that were once isolated, uh, the fact that we have more and more hunting that's leading to increased contact between people and primates that are particularly susceptible to human diseases and vice versa. All of these things are quite worrying. In particular for gorillas, Ebola has been a really big problem. So in 2003, there was an Ebola outbreak in, in the Republic of Congo. At one site 
in the Republic of Congo. They estimate that 5,000 of their guerrillas were killed in that outbreak. And many other populations are presumed to have had similar losses. What's even more alarming than that is that models have been run to show that at the current Ebola epi epizoonotic rate, so the rate at which it seems to affect guerrillas, the population of guerrillas could further decline by 97% over the next 100 years. And that's taking into consideration us controlling things like hunting and like habitat destruction. So the effect and the impact of infectious disease on gorillas is really, really concerning. One of the regions identified as being highly suitable for a future Ebola outbreak is Equatorial Guinea. And there are collaborative efforts that are going on across Sub-Saharan Africa to try to monitor and prevent Ebola outbreaks. But at the moment, none of that work is being done in Equatorial Guinea. So this is an area that actually we are starting to look at with partners to try to fill that knowledge gap on the health of great apes and monkeys. But I will, um, I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment, uh, a bit later on. So let's go back to Equatorial Guinea just for a moment. As I said before, probably many people don't know that much about it, but Equatorial Guinea is actually was considered and is considered to be one of the wealthiest countries in Africa. And it experienced quite rapid economic growth in the late 90s. And this was due to the discovery of offshore oil and production peaked in about 2004. And despite the country's economic windfall from oil, um, there ha and their uh, increasing investment in infrastructure, there hasn't been that much investment in improved livelihoods or living standards for the human population. So Equatorial Guinea, we're doing quite well. You can see at the bottom photograph there is a picture of the capital city of Malabo. So this was a new area that was built up called Malabo Dos or the second Malabo um, outside of the old city. And you can see it's a port on the edge of the island there. You can see the ocean in, in the distance. But the drop in oil prices, the global oil prices in 2014, placed significant strain on the budgets of the country. And it pushed them into a recession. And this becomes incredibly important when we start to talk about uh, pressures on biodiversity. So what we started to see is that their reserves were dwindling. They already knew this, that, the, that their reserves would not last forever, but then also there was this drop in the global oil prices. And this led to a lot of people who had been working in, in different building projects, in different, um, in different economic, in different sectors of, of business in the cities to actually have to leave the cities and move back to villages. So they were living, you know, sort of what we would consider uh, very similar lives to us, regular jobs, nine to five um, houses in the city. And then all of that dried up with the drop in, in, oil, uh, in, in oil in 2014. We see a lot of people flooding back to the villages and there wasn't really any work for them there. And so a lot of people started to turn to hunting. And as more and more hunting was happening, that led to fewer animals in the forest. But the opposite of what we would expect, expect happened. So normally if there's fewer animals in the forest, but there's still a demand for bushmeat in the cities, which was happening, we would expect to see that the prices would rise. But actually there were so many hunters competing for sales that the prices continued to drop. And people were telling us it's incredibly difficult to find um, bush meat or, or wild meat in the forest. And sometimes they would have to go looking for meat upwards of 10, 12 days to be able to get enough to sell, to be able to make an income to feed their families. So this leads to intense pressure, both on the human population and also on the wildlife. So it's really quite a tragic situation. It's important to understand uh, the situation with commercial wildlife trade in this particular part of the world. And this is, this is really an intense, 
and quite um, economically powerful uh, industry. And commercial hunting for city markets is the primary threat to wildlife in this region. So estimates from US Fish and Wildlife last uh, in 2018, sorry, uh, were that over 5 million tons of wild meat are taken from the forests in Central Africa each year. So this is an incredible amount of wildlife being taken from these forests. And again, in Equatorial Guinea, that was fueled because of rapid economic growth. So most local people might eat enough for subsistence, but a lot of the meat is sold to the cities and it's driven by a demand because bush meat or wild meat is seen as a luxury item. So even though it has been a critical component of the diet of a lot of forest living people in tropical forest regions for a very long time, actually in this particular region, it's more of a luxury item for people in the higher socioeconomic classes. And so hunting itself is not so much the problem as it is the fact that there is this market economy driving the commercial wildlife trade to unsustainable levels. The other issue is that there are now is the use of firearms. So before traditional, uh, traditional tools would have been used for hunting and that would have limited the number of items or, or number of animals that could be taken from the forest. But now with the use of shotguns, for example, more and more animals can be taken at once which really exacerbates the problem. So just to say, there'll be a couple of slides here with some sort of disturbing bushmeat or wild meat images. So primates are really the preferred um, menu item. You can see here a Proises monkey, which is a critically endangered um, uh, colobus monkey. You can see a porcupine, a pouched rat, also here quite, quite a few pouched rats, but primates again fetch some of the highest prices. And it's important to know that domestic meat, so things like chicken, uh, fish, for example, are actually sold, are readily available, and there's, they're sold for a lower amount in the supermarkets and in the markets. So again, this is really a luxury item. Even though people target primates, they are not the only thing on the menu. So you can see here a uh, pangolin, which I'm sure you've heard quite a lot about as being a really seriously uh, serious problem in the bushmeat trade. Diker, which is um, hanging next to quite a long snake and dwarf crocodile, which is another one that um, is, is hunted quite frequently. And you can see here that they are actually still alive because um, if they can, they can transport them that way tied up and that keeps the meat fresh. So this is incredibly worrying obviously for species loss, but it's also worrying for some of the things we've already talked about in terms of disease. So wild animals we know are reservoirs for pathogens and people who come into contact with them uh, risk being infected with zoonotic diseases and then leading as we know to, to the issues that we're facing today. So this is why it's really important for us to better understand and control what's happening with commercial uh, markets. But in addition to hunting for the bushmeat trade or wild meat or commercial wildlife trade, um, we also find that primates can be sold as pets. So in particular, infant chimpanzees, infant gorillas um, can be taken and sold to hotels where they will be um, used to entertain tourists. Um, and then also people have, keep them as pets in their, own, in their own homes. And unfortunately in Equatorial Guinea, unlike some of the neighboring countries, we don't have a, um, any type of sanctuary that can take these animals. And it's very difficult to move infant chimps, infant gorillas across borders between these countries. So even if they are confiscated, currently there's no place for those animals to go. So those are general threats to wildlife and more specifically primates uh, in Equatorial Guinea. Another threat that we've identified to gorillas specifically is persecution from crop raiding. So gorillas have been reported in farms neighboring the forests and destroying crops. And that's very difficult for poor people who are reliant on those foods to eat or to sell. 
So in the photographs you can see here, this is a banana plant and the gorilla has come and actually snapped the whole stem because what they want, they're not coming necessarily for the bananas, they're coming for that really juicy stem that's inside the plant. So they'll break the entire tree. So this is incredibly destructive um, and really problematic for, for people who are living alongside these animals. What we don't know quite yet is how much damage is actually being caused in farms by gorillas and how much is by other animals. So we do have some camera trap images that we set up in farms to try to understand the situation a bit better. And we're seeing quite a lot of large rodents, for example, something they call a mamota, which uh, is causing quite a lot of damage. And we don't understand anything about what times of year it might happen. Is it because there's less food in the forest? Um, so there's lots that we're trying to understand. And we're actually designing a study at the moment to better get a handle on what's happening uh, with crop rating. So what I want to do now is move more specifically to our particular project in Monte So in 2018, we were looking for a site for our Western Lowland Gorilla Conservation Project. We'd been working in Cameroon for many, many years and decided that we felt like we could make a, more of an impact in conservation in another site. So we used this document, the Regional Action Plan for the Conservation of Western Lowland Gorilla and Chimpanzee which is a document put together by the IUCN Species uh, Survival Commission Primate Specialist Group, the Great Ape Section. And they have gone through and highlighted areas of critical importance for Western Lowland Gorilla and Central Chimpanzee conservation. And one of those priority landscapes is the Monte Alain Monte Cristal Abanga landscape that you can see here on the map in purple. And it's a site of exceptional importance for gorilla conservation because it holds more than 5% of the global population of this species. It's also described as having a very high irreplaceability value. This means that were you to conserve a different region, you wouldn't actually have the same conservation impact because of the incredibly high level of biodiversity in this region. So we knew from this, from this document that this was a really, really key area for gorilla conservation and, and chimpanzee con conservation. And that was one of the main um, things we were looking for in our conservation project. So this is, um, this is our team. So the project is directed by uh, myself, which you can see there, and Dr. David Fernandez, who is um, a senior lecturer at UE Bristol, the University of the West of England in Bristol. So this is a joint project between the university and Bristol Zoological Society. We also have a postdoc, Pat McLaughlin, who uh, is our project manager on the ground. And until very recently, when he was um, evacuated back to the US, he was actually based in Equatorial Guinea running the project on the ground. Some of what we're going to talk about here today was collected by our former postdoc, uh, Dr. Caspian Johnson, who now works in a, as a lecturer at Bristol Zoological Society. And then we work very closely with the Director General of Indifor. Indifor is the uh, protected area management side of the national government of Equatorial Guinea. So they're the, the um, institution responsible for protected area management. Mr. Fidel Isona Mba and his field team, you can see some of, their picture, uh, some of them in the picture below, Salvador Presentacion and Licinia with our field technician Alvaro there who also was recently evacuated uh, back to Spain. So at the moment, our field team has all been um, evacuated out of the country. And even within the country, um, the local field team is, is at home in the city. They're, no, they're not able to go into the forest either. So what I'm gonna talk to you about for the rest of the talk is really what we've been doing and our conservation actions. Um, I should highlight that, again, this is quite a new project. So we started in 2018. We did a bit of pilot study, preliminary work, to find out what the best and most effective way to carry out our, our, our monitoring was going to be in 2019. And then 2020 was really gonna be our first year of rolling everything out and getting a full year of survey work done and, and initiating a lot of collaborations. And of course, um, three months into that, everything's on hold because of coronavirus. So I'll explain here some of our planned conservation actions and what we've been able to do to date. Um, and 
some of this then, well, this all hopefully will continue on once things um, have returned to whatever normal is going to look like. And you can see here an image again of the National Park um, and in the distance there, Monte Chocolate. So that's um, Chocolate Mountain, which is um, obviously, sounds like an amazing place to search for gorillas. So one of the main aims of our project is standardized monitoring for great apes and other large mammals. So our first task was to try to understand what is the best way to monitor within the park. Now, because it is a mountainous park, because it is very dense with the forest, there aren't that many trails, um, we decided to use camera traps. And we were working with a partner organization, uh, Bio, uh, sorry, Biodiversity Initiative, who had been using camera trap arrays in other protected areas within Equatorial Guinea to try to understand species presence and absence. And so we decided to work alongside them to lay out some camera traps and see how we could use that to actually survey for these animals and determine occupancy and density. So where are these animals found within the park and how many of them are living there? Um, and are there particular areas that are actually hot spots for gorillas or for some of these other species? We are also long-term monitoring uh, the bush meat markets and any type of uh, wildlife that's for sale along the roads. We're interested as well in other species. So obviously you can see here, there's no gorillas in this picture, but we're monitoring for all large and medium sized mammals like chimpanzees, like mandrels, like forest elephants and leopards. And we're doing this using, as I said, this camera trap array. So we're placing 30 camera traps systematically across the national park. And I should say here, this is an example map. So due to the sensitivity of where animals might be found within the park and the incredible pressure from poaching within the park, um, it's unethical for us to actually release the places where we would uh, have our cameras placed. Uh, but this gives you an idea of, of how we might actually uh, distribute cameras within the park. We also are using bioacoustic recorders. So these are machines that record all the ambient noise within the environment. And we're using that largely to better understand hunting pressure. So we can hear shotguns, we can hear um, the chopping down of trees, we can hear people, people talking within the forest, and those sorts of things will help us understand which areas are the most heavily hunted. We're also doing just traditional line transects, so walking throughout the forest to do uh, ape nest counts, um, any type of primate census, so actually collecting observations, particularly of arboreal primates that are more difficult to catch on camera traps. And we're doing health monitoring. So taking swabs of fecal samples, we're also taking swabs of any carcasses we might find. So an animal that we're not quite sure why it died, that is particularly important to us for this disease surveillance work that we're doing. Some of the first things that we did uh, when we went out into the field were to place the camera traps and the bioacoustic recorders, as you can see in the top images there. Um, and we were quite keen to do that because we had the original data back from Biodiversity Initiative. You can see that incredible photo they have there uh, from a different protected area in, Cam um, sorry, in Equatorial Guinea, showing a mother gorilla with that tiny little baby gorilla in her arms. I'm not sure if you can see that very, very clearly there. So we knew that there were gorillas within the protected areas and that camera traps could catch them. And so we were really keen to try this method ourselves and, and, and see how that works. But we also spent time in the villages trying to understand a bit more of the human side of the equation. So we spent a lot of time with community leaders, talking to them about how they make their money, um, what sort of amenities their, their communities have. I absolutely love this image because this is the president of one village and his wife. And when we first walked into their home, which they so graciously let us, let us come in and talk to them in, um, I thought maybe she operated a shop, but actually in this particular community, the way you demonstrate your wealth is by having all of these different cooking implements. So she has all these different pots and, and um, buckets and other, and other kitchen containers. Um, and most of them apparently she won't use. She, she saves them up and she gives them to her, the wives of her son or her own daughters or her grandchildren later on. So they're actually like uh, her savings, like her investment. 
Um, and she was very, very proud that we took that photograph of, of, of her in front of them there. We also spent time talking with hunters in the villages. You can see in that bottom photograph, we were showing them images of primates that 20 years ago had been reported within the park. And they were telling us whether or not they routinely still see them, hunt them, and which ones they don't see anymore. And what it was, it was very useful and very interesting because there were a number of species that had been reported in the past to be in the park and they quite clearly had not ever seen them or um, certainly hadn't seen them in quite a long time, which is obviously very, very worrying, but an important piece of information for us. So going out into the forest is, is quite, um, quite an effort. It it's, takes quite a lot of organization. So the field team have a lot of kit that they take with them. We have a lot of porters that come along with us to help us get camp set up in the forest. The team will often go into the forest for one or two weeks at a time. They'll camp there, they'll set up the camera traps, they'll conduct the line transects, and they'll look for those signs of gorillas and other animals and signs of hunting. And you can see here in this image, the forest really is beautiful. But I will say that this really hides the reality of working in Monte Helene. It's very, very steep and muddy and wet, and the terrain can be quite treacherous in many, many places. So the field team have often told me that these pictures don't really best represent how field work is there, but it certainly shows you how incredible the forest is. So as I said before, we were planning this year to be our first full year of data collection, but unfortunately things have, have, um, are on pause. But we wanted to give you a little bit of a, a preview of what we're seeing so far from our data. So the orange and the gray lines are from previous studies. What the orange one from 2005, the gray one from 2013. Our study presented there in blue. Now, some important differences between these data sets is that our work is mostly done on transects that are relatively close to the villages. So that's one reason why the number uh, or the encounter rate, so the number of signs of a particular species that we see per kilometer is significantly lower compared to previous studies. And certainly if we had had more data, we probably would be seeing slightly higher numbers. However, the pattern is still the same and we are seeing that there are certain animals that were seen very commonly in 2005 that we didn't see at all and even the 2013 study didn't see at all, such as the gray cheeked mangabe, the Mona monkey. So that is very, very worrying. It solidifies why we think it is so important that we're undertaking this conservation work in this region. It's also really important to understand how difficult getting some of this data is. So actually spotting, particularly gorilla nests is very, very difficult. So I'm not sure how many of you would have walked by what, what you're seeing here in this image and said, oh yeah, that looks like a gorilla nest, but it is. So gorillas can be a little bit lazy when it comes to making nests. They don't make you know, beautiful, comfy, leafy looking nests the way chimpanzees do. They tend to just push over some branches on the ground and sit down. Uh, so you really need to know what you're looking for. Sometimes you get lucky and you'll find little bits of hair or you'll find feces nearby. And so you'll, you'll be certain that what you have is a gorilla nest. But finding them is very, very tricky. And that's one of the reasons why it's very, very important to go with a local guide who knows exactly what they're looking for. So one of the most amazing parts of, of our study is that we are actually finding gorillas still in this area. So several years ago, I had spoken to some people who had been in these forests maybe 10 years ago, and they had told me there's no gorillas there anymore. 100% the gorillas have left. So when we first went in here, we were preparing ourselves for that, for that fact. And it was just absolutely incredible when the field team first started looking through the pictures they'd taken off of the camera traps and they first saw those gorilla pictures. They were very, very excited. So we've been really, really lucky to catch the gorillas on our camera traps already, as well as to see signs of them. And now the field team have also seen them in person in the forest. So 
we obviously got quite a lot of press attention for that, which is incredible because it really shares the news of this area and why it's so important to protect it and, and shares the news of the project. But for us in particular, these pictures were so meaningful because they were showing young gorillas. So we know that the groups are still breeding despite the pressures that they're facing. And that's again, really, really positive for us. So in addition to our monitoring projects that we're doing, we're also investigating ecological and anthropogenic drivers. So what is it that might actually be leading to population decline? And again, what we're finding time and time again is it, might, it probably has to do with hunting. So these are some of the most common images that we get on our camera traps, images of hunters. And you can see that not only do they have machetes, but they have hot, uh, shotguns, which are illegal. Guns are illegal in this country. It's also illegal to hunt primates in this country, monkeys and apes. But you can see in the upper picture there, uh, someone with a monkey on their back carrying, carrying them out. But most worrying was the photograph at the bottom showing that they're hunting with dogs. Dogs can take out many ground dwelling animals very quickly. And for primates like mandrills or young gorillas or young chimps that are gonna be on the ground, this could put them at serious risk. This is also particularly true when we talk about infectious disease. So for example, we have these images that have come through on our camera traps that show these drills. So the two pictures at the bottom, you can see the images of drills where they seem to be missing a lot of hair. We're not quite sure what's happening. Typically, um, hair loss like this happens because of stress, um, but it could also be some type of infectious disease. It could be mange. We don't really have enough close enough images to be able to see for sure, but we have had our vets at Bristol Zoo helping us to look through these images to try to figure out what's going on. You can also see that even though we were very excited to get these images of the gorillas, they have something quite strange about their face, these patches of discoloration. And again, we've seen it in a couple of different individuals and we're looking at that and trying to understand what that might be. There's some indication that it could be yaws, which is again, another infectious disease. So we're continuing to look for these signs as we get more images back. And this is another reason why we're really, really keen on monitoring wildlife health in this region. So what are our next steps? Obviously we're gonna continue our monitoring program continue the camera trapping and bioacoustics as well as the line transects as soon as things get back to normal. We are working with um, the Zoological Society of London with ZSL's Instant Wild project to set up ESM enabled camera traps, which would allow us to have pictures come back in real time. And then we could have actually the public help us to go through and identify animals. One of the issues we're having at the moment is trying to get phone signal deep enough into the forest to be able to actually have those images come back in real time. So it's a bit of a work in progress. We've also joined the National Association Against Illegal Hunting. This is a, a network to try to um, tackle the wildlife trade in Equatorial Guinea, and it's funded out of the US Fish and Wildlife Services. So right now it is a large scale project that will try to monitor commercial wildlife and also mitigate against it. It also has funding to help implement SMART. SMART is a program that can be used by rangers, eco guards, conservation service professionals to monitor and record incidents of illegal activity inside protected areas and send it back in real time to people who can then um, deploy uh, rangers to deal with those issues and also help them to create plans to tackle these issues in a more strategic way. And so we're very keen to get SMART implemented. It's used successfully in a lot of different protected areas around the world and we're very keen to get that implemented in Equatorial Guinea. And as I said before, we're looking at how we can start to better understand human wildlife interactions. What what's going on with crop rating and the complexity behind it? And can we help local people to seek solutions that work to protect their crops, but also to protect wildlife? And so we're, that's something that right now we're seeking funding for going forward. So what I've presented to you today might seem a little bit depressing, talking about hunting, talking about endangered species, it's always very, very difficult, but I think I'm still optimistic. And in particular, I'm still optimistic about the situation in Equatorial Guinea specifically. 
And that's because when we speak to people there, they actually prefer not to hunt. Hunting is hard. They have to go into the forest for several weeks at a time. Sometimes they come back with nothing. And they, many of them are used to, as I said, having a comfortable life in the city. And so if we can come up with alternatives and alternatives are possible, um, then I think it won't be that difficult to actually change attitudes. That's not the case in every place where, where commercial wildlife trade is a problem, but it is a possibility here. We also talked to a lot of people who said the young people, they don't wanna eat bushmeat. They're not interested in porcupine or pangolin. They wanna have chicken, just like everybody else. So a lot of people have said that actually, as we move and we start to um, have this younger generation grow up, there might not be as much of a bushmeat problem in Equatorial Guinea anymore. We also see it as being ripe for ecotourism. If we can get the, the bushmeat problem and hunting and animals being sold on the side of the road under control, then it will be a much more attractive place for people to be able to come in and see um, potentially in the future wild gorillas, but certainly it's an incredible place for birding. Um, and you know, it is a stable country and you can't say that about a lot of these countries in this region. So if they take the right steps and it's done in a sustainable way, ecotourism could be a really, a really good option for this particular region. Also, we've had very, very positive meetings with the government there. And because of that, I think it helps us to move forward and to do things that have an impact. And probably most importantly, this particular forest, Monte Land, but also the forest outside of the protected area is lush and it's intact. And the photograph here was taken in one of the lakes within the park where our team actually stumbled upon gorillas nesting. Now they were spooked by the team and they ran off, which is fine because that's a behavior that protects them. But we were able to collect fecal samples from that nest for our disease surveillance project. And this particular area looks exactly to me like a gorilla paradise. And with proper protection, I think we could make sure that it is. So I just wanna say a special thank you to our partners in this project, but in particular, our funders. So National Geographic, the Arcus Foundation, ZSL Instant Wild, and the US Fish and Wildlife Services have been incredibly supportive of the project to date. We also have internal funding, obviously, from Bristol Zoological Society's donors and from the University of the West of England. So it's really, really important that they're helping us to safeguard the future of this critically endangered species. So I just wanna say thank you to you for coming tonight and for listening. Um, I hope that it was uh, enjoyable for you that you learned something about gorillas in Equatorial Guinea. I just also wanna say that um, obviously Bristol Zoo is closed at this time and so is our sister site, the Wild Place Project. But all of our staff, our animal staff and our vet staff are still working very, very hard to protect the animals. And we are, also working hard in our field projects. So even though our staff in the field aren't able to go into the forest to, to, to undertake field work, we are still supporting them to ensure that they're getting a salary. Um, and that's very obviously very tricky when we don't have the income of the guests coming through our door. So if it's possible for you to share the link on the screen with your networks of people, or if on the off chance it's possible for you to donate yourself, that's obviously greatly appreciated. But in any case, thank you so much for your support and just for listening tonight. And I would be very, very happy to take um, any questions that you might have. So I'm just having a quick look at the messages, Gronya. Firstly, thank you very much for a fascinating talk. Um, so I have a question from Amy Huntley. Do the field workers ever come across hunters? Yeah, good question. Uh, they do a lot, actually. It's probably the most common thing <laughs> uh, that we come across in the forest. Um, sometimes hunting camps, but also just people who are, who are coming in and out of the forest. Um, one of the reasons for that is that there's very few trail in the forest, and so we use the trails that the hunters have actually created. I had another question from Caroline asking um, how they could help. Oh, that's a great question. So two things I think you can do. Um, 
if you could spread the word, that would be amazing. So just getting the word out there about uh, the project and the work that the zoo is doing in Equatorial Guinea is incredibly helpful. So one of the things that I find most often is that people say, I had no idea that Bristol Zoo did any of those things. So your help in spreading the message of some of the conservation work would be really incredible. Um, and then, as I said before, if it is possible to, to donate, um, to try to help keep these conservation projects going, that's incredibly Im important. Um, and in the future, should the world go back to normal and there's any type of travel, we would recommend that people consider Equatorial Guinea for, for tourism, for example. So we have a related question from Kat. What um, was tourism like historically in Equatorial Guinea? Yeah, it's always been a bit tricky because they're quite a closed society. So actually getting a visa can be difficult. Um, if you are an American or um, a couple of other nationalities, you don't need a visa. And so tourism from those nationalities has been a bit easier. We do find that local tourism is, is quite high. So not Equato Guineans, but actually people who are based in Equatorial Guinea to work. So many, many major oil companies have compounds in Equatorial Guinea and, and other international companies. And their staff are uh, quite good about traveling around and doing some local tourism. But it has not always been a very big, a big field. Thank you. Um, I had a question from a similar question from two people from Susan and Victoria. Um, what do you think the impact will be post um, the coronavirus pandemic? How do you see that playing out kind of economically, for example? It's interesting. So there was an article that was recently written in a, a West African news magazine that actually looked across West African economies to see which ones would be most affected. And they predicted that Equatorial Guinea would be one of the worst hit, partly because their economy isn't very diversified. So they're so reliant on, on oil. And obviously, oil's in real trouble at the moment. And so that makes the situation for them quite tricky. Whereas other countries in the region, like Cameroon, have quite a diversified economy. And because of that, you know, they, they might be able to bounce back in ways that, that a country like Equatorial, Equatorial Guinea couldn't. So I'm worried for them, to be honest. I think it's going to be very, very difficult. Thank you. Um, there was a question from Lou who asks, what do you think the impact will be? Or are you concerned now that you don't have staff on the ground um, in these parks? I'm sorry, Mark, you cut out a little bit there. There was a question from Lou who asked, are you concerned now that your teams are not there on the ground? Yes, absolutely. So there's lots and lots of evidence that just having an active research presence at primate field sites decreases illegal activity. There have been a number of studies that have shown that across, across the world, maybe, maybe not even just primate field sites, but they're the, that's the literature I'm most familiar with. So I'm certainly worried that not having people in the field um, is problematic. Having said that, I think that the, the hunting, um, the culture of hunting at the moment and the reliance on hunting is so high that it's high anyway. So I'm not, you know, I'm not sure how much we were really preventing being there. But I am worried that because there's, a, there's actually a regional lockdown at the moment, so it's very difficult for people even to travel between towns, that if people aren't able to get out to get food supplies from, say, supermarkets in nearby cities, et cetera, then that will put more pressure on natural resources. Thank you. Um, I'm... I'm aware that we're nearly at the end of time, so I might just ask one more quick question. Um, so we had a question from Marjo, which was, um, do people in Equatorial Guinea perceive there to be, for example, additional medicinal benefits to consuming bushmeats other than just the nutritional content? So it's interesting, you don't see as often 
this reliance on it for say medicinal purposes or in some cultures sometimes there is you know people feel like some animals have magical properties and you don't you don't see that as much i'm not aware of it as being um, a big issue there that's not to say that it doesn't happen um but for example um I mentioned before that they have obviously quite what appears to be quite a healthy population of forest elephants and they are not really hunted there for their tusks. Instead, they are taken for meat. So it really does seem to be that meat is the primary driver of, of hunting there. Thank you, Grania. There are actually quite a lot more um, really, <laughs> really good questions that I wish that we had um, more time to talk about, but it's it's the end of the it's the end of our time for this particular lecture. Um, so, firstly, thank you very much again for your talk, um, everybody. For thank you very much for for joining us. You can now see up on the screen um, the 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 slide for our, our next talk, which is in a fortnight's time, mm -hmm. um, which will be Dr. Ali Cotton, another member of the conservation and science team here at Bristol Zoo. And she'll be talking about the plight of African penguins. They are what they eat. Oh, so I look forward to seeing you hopefully all, all in two weeks time and have a lovely evening and stay healthy and happy. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Thank you.